Every anime protagonist needs their foil. Goku has Vegeta, Naruto has Sasuke, Shinji has clinical depression. An anime main character is nothing without a deuteragonist that acts as a stark opposite to the ideal that a character stands for. A lot of the time in anime, at least in shonen, our main character is an optimistic sunshine boy who believes in the power of hard work and friendship, which means that the foil is dark and brooding, who starts off believing that friends will only hold them back before becoming a big ol' pink wearing softy later on in the series. And this idea of a main character being mirrored by another character in the story is nothing new, and we can trace the origins back to some of the earliest fictive texts ever. Cain had Abel. Gods of law and order are opposed by gods of chaos and trickery. Gods of heaven are opposed by gods of the underworld. Even Shakespeare was playing around with foils, presenting animated duos of characters that could not be more different throughout his works. For a writer, conveying themes personified through a character is hard, and sometimes the best way to guide the audience to understanding those themes is to show the complete opposite of everything your main character stands for. If your shonen MC believes in the power of hard work to overcome their faults, their foil should try and take shortcuts. If the main character thinks that friends and bonds are what makes them strong, the foil should turn heel and cut ties with those same friends and go off on their own. Good writing is showing, not telling, that our protagonist exemplifies the morals of the fiction. But it's through the foil that you can come to your own conclusions, that even though getting a sick-ass neck tat as a 12-year-old is cool, indentured servitude to a psychotic snake man is not. But what does that mean when your protagonist is, well, not like other anime protagonists? As we talked about in my Lyos video, Lyos reads like a subversion of common anime main characters. So what would that make his perfect foil? Of all the fantastic characters of Ryoko Kui's Delicious in Dungeon, Kaburu is easily one of my favorites. In a show brimming with intrigue, complex world building, and characters with deep histories obscure just out of sight, Kaburu stands out as maybe one of the most enigmatic and alluring of the entire bunch. One part Claude Fire Emblem, one part Band of the Hawk Griffith, before the incident, don't kill me, and all parts sweet little guy whom I will cherish to the end of my days. Kaburu is a shining example of what makes Dungeon Meshi's characters so compelling. His mystery, his motives, and his direct contrast to the main character, Laos Toden. Kaburu is introduced with his party, another group of adventurers, with a completely different vibe to Laos' party's own. The difference in their presentation is immediate. Rin, the mage of Kabru's party, has a chilly severity about her, making Marcel, the only other mage that we've seen up until this point, seem downright amateur hour in comparison. Please, Marcel, this was just a script, forgive me. Rin takes one look at one of Marcel's spells and flippantly remarks, ah, a mage college student, because it's so by the books and it bears all the telltale signs of someone terrified of doing something the wrong way. Maribel, the half-foot, is more of a trickster than Chilchuck is and travels with a partner, something that grumpy old Chilchuck probably would never subject himself to. There's a healer who my live chat says that I hate, there's a dwarf fighter, and there's Kuro, a kobold who is basically as much of a dog person as Laos is. We're introduced to this party as a tonal shift away from the comedy and levity of Laos's party up until this point to something a bit more serious. Finally, this is a group of real adventurers in this world, taking their delve into the dungeon seriously, and we're about to see exactly what they can do. And they immediately die. Kabru's team is immediately party wiped by treasure insects who, without a monster freak in their party to determine there might be danger, let their guard down to fatal consequences. But this is a dungeon after all, and as we've learned, death is only temporary. Upon getting resurrected, Kabru's group continues on their way. The death was just a roadblock in this team's story because this time, nothing can stop them. This time, nothing can stand in their way. This time, yeah, um, they immediately die again. I guess the one thing that Kabru's party has in common with Laos's is that you should expect the unexpected. After being resurrected, Kabru's team is put in a precarious situation with some bandits, and after discerning the hook of the encounter, literally that's a fish joke, that it's all an illusion, Kabru mercilessly, frighteningly slaughters them before continuing along their way like it's just another day at the office. So why were they so easily defeated before, not once but twice by low floor monsters, but so proficient against these thieves? Well, that is the dichotomy of Kabru. Remember everything that I said about foil characters that you definitely didn't skip and were totally paying attention to? 
Well, Kabru serves as a foil to Laos in exactly the ways that you'd expect, where Laos knows a ton about monsters and uses that obsessive knowledge to navigate his party through the dungeon, we can see through Kabru's perspective that traversing this dungeon without any knowledge of monsters is perilous at best and continuously fatal at worst. We're reminded that while Laos is a complete freak, it's kind of because he's a complete freak that the group continuously makes it so far beyond what they might seem ordinarily capable of. On paper, Kabru seems like he should be the protagonist of a fantasy series, not acting as some bit player on another team. You see, unlike Laios, who is constantly unable to say the right thing or relate to people, Kabru doesn't have that issue. Dude is effortlessly charismatic, easily the smoothest talking character of the entire series, but just naturally having a 20 charisma isn't all there is to Kabru. Kabru has this innate, borderline creepy, kind of psychotic ability to read and study people. He just gets them. He picks up on the subtlest context clues and pieces together all the rumors he hears above ground to know anything and everything about anyone he chooses. Kabru kind of a gossipy queen confirmed. It's actually through Kabru that we get our first real exposition into the pasts of characters that have never been mentioned up until this point in the story, which in and of itself is a, such a fun bit of storytelling. Through Kabru's accounts of the talks and rumors of the town, he's actually very familiar with Laios' party, more familiar than we are as an audience. It's through these accounts that we learn what Laios and everyone were doing up until now, which was some questionable stuff. We have this real moment of, was Laios' party? Were they the bad guys? Like, what? What's going on here? <laughs> and with Kabru stating that he'd like to be there when the Toten's masks are removed, we get this real ambiguity to what his motives actually are. Is he just preying on the Toten siblings' downfall from afar? Does he want to help? What is going on? Not only is Kabru adept at reading people or memorizing their personal details like he's the most beautiful eyelashed boy detective, but he's also adept at subtly manipulating people, whether they notice or not. In the manga liner notes, there's this really interesting translation note that Kabru changes his own honorifics in Japanese when speaking to adventurers above ground and when he's meeting with Laios and Shuro in the dungeon. Before, he uses Ore to refer to himself as a grown-ass man. And then face to face with Laios, he uses the much more childish and I'm just a little guy coded Boku. So when he's speaking above ground, he wants everyone to see him as a capable adventurer, which he is. But when he's speaking to Laios, he wants to appear as harmless and innocent as possible to avoid all suspicion. And he also imagines murdering Laios like several different times when he's forcing him to eat a harpy egg, but that's neither here nor there. Much like Lyo seems like a subversion of an anime hero if you want to interpret his character that way, Kabru is Ryo Kokui's in-universe example that a typical shonen protagonist won't work here. You can't talk no jutsu your way through monsters incapable of reasoning. You can't slash your way through encounters without knowing anything about the creatures you're fighting. Not only does Kabru freeze up when he sees monsters, we'll get into that, but he can't even imagine where he would even begin attacking. When he sees the sea dragon, which he initially confuses with a kraken, he tries to determine where to strike, looking for some kind of weakness, but his over-analysis paralyzes him, and he's only saved from yet another death when Shuro's team makes the save. When Kabru shocks everyone and stabs Fallon directly in her heart, what would have been a fatal wound to the human Fallon barely makes a scratch on her new chimera form, which Laios is quick to determine must mean her vitals are in the monster half. If Laios is supposed to represent an unlikely solution to the encounters of Dungeon Meshi, Kabru is meant to express the exact opposite, that just being an anime hero isn't enough in this world, that things that might work in another series, for another character, won't always mean that it'll work in this one. In a conversation with Laios, we get the first hint of Kabru's backstory. In a second, if you're paying attention, it tells us everything we might have suspected about him and the roots of his persistent hesitation towards monsters. Kabru's hometown, his mother, and everything he loved was wiped out by monsters that escaped a dungeon that went through a similar growth spurt to the dungeon central to our story. And while that was just a hint at a backstory brilliantly foreshadowed for us, we get the full reveal in the meeting with the Island Lord and the Canaries later in the series. Monsters overflowed from the dungeon, annihilating everyone, and the dead were transformed into even more monsters. 
It's this terrifying event that steeled Kabru's resolve firmly against dungeons growing out of hand, and he takes his own sense of justice very seriously, not only for himself but for the entire world of Dungeon Meshi. It's through Kabru that we start to delve into the political intrigue of this world and start to explore this idea of a conflict of interest between these fantasy races. Kabru remarks that the elves gaining too much influence could be terrible, and not just for the dungeon, not just for the island, but for the entire world. For me, this is almost an Attack on Titan moment where you realize that everything we know about this world is so isolated and insular to this one location, this single dungeon, this one island town. But it's through Kabru and everything happening above ground that we realize, wait a second, there's an entire world to this story. It's also through Kabru that we get the first direct counter to Laos's party's ideals. While we know the party would do anything to save Fallon, Kabru counters that with a cold, brutal, real question. Just how many other people will have to die just to save this one person? Is this personal victory worth it if it has catastrophic ramifications to the rest of the island? That's not to say that Kabru is cold or unsympathetic to everything that's happening. Quite the opposite, really. He's so concerned about the greater good and everything that's going on on a world scale that to him, one life and one person seems insignificant in comparison. And I think it's this sense of justice, this sense of morality, that actually makes Kabru a very interesting character, especially when considering the end game of this entire series. While we know that Laos only cares about his own, kind of sus, monster munching interests, Kabru is deeply invested in the outcome of this dungeon meshy prophecy Game of Thrones. Kabru considers Delgal's final words, the promise to bestow a kingdom to the one who slays the Mad Mage, as an actual, tangible, important goal in this series which again directly counters Laos' own seeming disinterest. And unlike Chilchuk and Marcel laughing at the idea of Laos being a king, it's actually not hard to see Kabru making a great king, and it's something that his party seems to agree with. And hell, it's something I agree with. I think looking at this cast, Kabru makes the most convincing leader of the entire bunch. If Kabru was king, he could prevent this island from ending up like Utaya which makes the next aspect of his character even more heartbreaking. Kabru knows that he'll never accomplish this. Kabru knows that his fear of monsters means that he can never achieve his goal. Kabru is someone who appears to have it all going on for him with every single credential it would take to be a capable ruler, but who is also fundamentally and paradoxically unable to achieve his dreams. And again, in direct contrast, we have Laos, who is someone who doesn't want that dream, who doesn't have that goal, and yet he seems like the most likely person to actually pull it off. But there's a little bit more to that. When speaking with the Island Lord and the Canaries, Kabru admits that Laos is probably the most likely candidate to fulfill Delgal's will. But Lyo seems to balk at the idea of killing people, taking responsibility, and rising to this occasion. I actually really doubt that Laos would kill the Mad Mage even if he wanted to, even if he had to. As far as I can remember, Laos hasn't actually killed a single humanoid in this entire story, and I don't think that starts with killing Thistle. But of course, Kabru has no issue killing humanoids. Kabru doesn't even hesitate. Could Kabru be the one who kills the Mad Mage or some other humanoid later in the series? Has all of this been leading up to a moment where a man so afraid of monsters becomes a monster himself? <sighs> I have no idea what the future holds for Kabru, but that's part of what makes him such an interesting character. At the end of season one, he's venturing into the dungeon with Shuro and Namari and the Western Elves right behind him to clear out the dungeon. But what comes after that? Will he descend back down alongside the Western Elves? Will his own party rejoin him? Will he team up with Laos? Surely there's a larger part for Kabru to play in this story still, even if it's just helping Laos' party out by eating Fallon's Chimera half. Although, he does hate the idea of eating monsters, so I'm not sure how well that one would go, but it really is interesting to think of the endgame of Dungeon Meshi and where these characters will end up. Does Laos truly become the king? Does he even want to become the king by the time this is all said and done? It would be kind of interesting to see if Laios did just want to continue adventuring, continue researching monsters and, you know, making meals out of them. But if Laios is concerned with his own adventures, maybe it is Kabru who steps up to lead the island. Maybe it's Kabru who even steps up to lead the golden country. 
achieving his dream of eradicating the dungeon's curse and becoming a benevolent ruler, not by himself, but with the help of everybody. Anyway, thank you guys for checking out this video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you liked this video, leave a like and leave a comment. What are your thoughts on Kabru? If you're an anime only, what do you think his arc is going to be in the second season? And if you're a manga reader, what were you thinking around this point in the story? As always, keep your comments spoiler free. There's a lot of anime onlys that watch these videos and I'm an anime only myself, so I don't know what happens later on in the story. So if you do leave a comment, make sure it's not spoiling anything for the rest of us. And finally, if you'd like to get more of my content, including all the VODs from my live reads of the Delicious and Dungeon manga, as well as some uh, bonus stuff coming very soon, check out my Patreon or become a YouTube channel member. All the support really helps. I'm a very small channel, so your support actually lets me take time out of my day to do these videos. A big thank you to everyone who supports. Their names will be on the screen here. And if you'd like to join those guys and help a small creator out, uh, you know what to do. So thank you guys, and until the next one, I'm Dom, this has been Kabru, peace.